the 2018 to order and invite you to join us in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The secretary, please take the uh, well, a roll after I read the fire. In case of fire, there are two ways to exit the chambers. To my left, to exit through the double doors. Turn left, walk down the flight of stairs, turn left again at the base, and uh, out the door, and please walk a safe distance away from that door. And the best way, perhaps, is at the rear of the chambers, where you'll exit through those double doors, and again, exit far enough away from the building. Charles Duran? Here. Charles Ladd? Here. Nick Lefakis? Here. Mary Scott? Here. Virginia Higley? Here. Ken Nelson? Oh, I know he's here, but he must be in the hallway. Alinda DeGray? Here. Sarah Gruber? Here. Guillermo Salazar? Here. Ember Suzak is here. Okay. We have a surprise tonight. It's very pleasant as we have the minutes. And the first one's December 21st, 2017. Make a motion to approve the minutes for December 21st. Second. Motion's made in the second to approve the motions of the, uh, the Minutes of December 21st. Any additions, errors, omissions? I have a few suggestions. Up at the top it says roll call, and it says uh, that it was taken at the aquifer protection. That's true, but it should be here also. Noted that it's it was taken for this, this particular meeting. Uh, also, on page three, there's uh, one, two, three, six down. It says motion, uh, motion. Commissioner Ladd made a motion, second by Commissioner Higley, to continue. And it's not uh, no reason to get uh, given to continue. And there should be a reason there. I don't know, I don't remember why. Sorry. That was for the truck, oh, I know what it was. That's because we hadn't notified the, uh, uh, the water company. Uh, yes, the water company hadn't been notified. It was continued because there was no report from the water. Right, and that's all I picked up on those. Anyone else? No. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a, I think there's a typo on page four. Uh, at the bottom of page four, ask your name, Chairman Duran, and then it says three times if anyone from the, I think we're missing the word asked. Okay, all mm -hmm. in favor as amended? Opposed, no abstentions, unanimous. January 11th. Make a motion to approve the minutes for January 11th. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any additions, errors, or omissions? Oh, this, these, there's quite a few. Uh, under election of chair, uh, it says to reappoint. Um, it's a reelect. And then. And this goes all the way through because it says Commission, Commissioner Higley made a motion second by Commissioner Scott to close nominations and the motion passed with 8 to 0 a vote. Then there's the vote for the chair, which is not here. And the, a motion would have been made, and that's repeated all the way for all the, uh, com for all the commission uh, officers. <coughs> there's no... There's no vote for the office. Uh, 
Okay, so those that should those all should be added. Okay. And that's all I picked up on that. So any other anything further? Hearing none, all in favor as amended. It's unanimous. Good. I'll, I'll abstain. One abstention, sorry. Okay. Make a motion to approve the minutes for Thursday, January 18th. Second. second. Oh. Motion's made seconded. Uh, any additions, errors, or omissions? I do have one. Okay. Um, it, DeGray should be listed as an alternate. Linda DeGray, alternate. And I think similarly, uh, was com absent was Commissioner Guillermo Salazar, but that's also alternate commissioner. Right. And also, my name has an H at the end, Sarah with an H. Oh, Sam, uh, uh, Sarah, yeah, okay. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know on the next paragraph where it says, uh, it can't be approved without aquifer protection agency approval but it was also the water company approval. Right, it's the same reason. So really that just uh, the water company should be added in there. Uh, can't be approved at this time without the Aquifer Protection Agency and water company approval. Anything further? I had one change yes. on page five. Um, the, essentially the last line, it was said, Commissioner Gruber asked whether the commission refunds bonds, to which Chairman Dern replied that Chairman or not. My question was whether we refund bonds piecemeal as they go along. It's not partial whether we... Bonds. Partial bond Partial release. bond releases, partial, not just yeah. bonds generally. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? Hearing none, all in favor as amended. Unanimous. It's, it's tough going through these and trying to remember... Uh, getting them accurate, but you know, this is a re <laughs> that's the reason for that I can raised it again last week or last last meeting. Okay, and uh, make a motion to approve the minutes for February first. Second. Motions made and seconded. Any additions, errors, or omissions? I do have one. First off, thank you so much. They're amazing. But <laughs> Please are, yeah. I, on page one at the bottom, I'm asking that we be consistent with Roger's name. On page two, top first line says Roger. <laughs> and then one, two, three, four, fifth. Again, you address him as Roger. So it, we need to. Well, you can call him that, but in the minutes. Okay. Well, I thought what we decided is the very first time you refer to me as Dr. O'Brien and everything else, every, uh, well, every time else after that was Roger. After that, because it goes on, they're referring to you as Mr. O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien. So yeah, right. in the rest of the minute. So that's, okay. that's the consistency. Consistency, yep. So we can either call you Roger, we can call you Hey You, but yeah. you know, just to be consistent. It's not late for supper. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's my biggest thing. Uh, anything, uh, anything? I have one on page 10 that more of a question than a thing. Let's see, paragraph one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph. We were talking about the escarpments and the sheet flow, and it says, Mr. Martucci stated in the proposed conditions a lot of that is cut off, picked up in the street, and brought to the detention basin where the velocity was slowed down to a point. A lot of what? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that was the Kenny. Yeah. It was water flow. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, that's what the applicant said. Hmm? That's what the applicant said, Mr. Martucci. That, that is what he said. It's a low spot. Which, well, maybe we'll see we went, we went back, back and looked. At, we went back and looked at the tape. Yeah. 
And we should, when he comes back, we should ask him what he's talking about. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Make a note of that. It wasn't a correction on you. I just didn't yeah. know what he was talking about. Anything further? I, I do have one on page 14, the third paragraph down. And it, 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 it indicates that Commissioner Suzak referred to Lot 34 as an example and asked about following the contour lines. And I believe after that lines, it says, should say for the 65 foot, you know, from top of slope setback which, you know, causes overlap of a possible building error. And, and then it makes some sense as to what we're referring to. So, you know, I think that that's the only thing that was missing. This is going to be important if we go back. Yeah, we need all the correctness on this one as possible because they already caught us once on this. Anything further? I, would you just repeat that? Yeah, it, it, it should be, you know, um, ask for the fo about following the contour lines for the 65 foot from top of slope setback. Yeah. All right. Anything further? Okay, Kenny. Uh, page nine, third to the bottom, or fourth to the uh, second to the bottom paragraph. It said he, uh, Mr. Nelson, he went on to re reiterate that the drainage issue should be up to the homeowners and put into the deeds, and that the commission should not accept the open space. It should be that open space, because I'm okay with the back, just not the two areas. That's all. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Okay, hearing none. All in favor as amended. Where are you, Linda? Okay. She's an alternate. Be unanimous. <laughs> She's an alternate. Did she give you permission to make the motions? No. I just want to check. I just. She's going to have to hit me later. Oh, okay. My mic's still on, by the way. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yep. At this point in the Planning and Zoning Commission welcomes comments, concerns, and opinions relating to Planning and Zoning in Enfield from anyone who is present, provided no one may discuss any matter of business at this time that is already elsewhere on the agenda, any matter that is part of an open public hearing of the Commission, or any matter where a decision of the Commission may be pending. Is there anyone would like to address the commission under those conditions at this time? Again, is there anyone would like to address the commission? Last call to address the commission. Okay, moving on. No bond releases. What happened, uh, Roger, to, we had a list and questions about bond releases way back and then, then nothing. It disappeared. It disappeared, right. Uh, and along with that was the mulch company. And we've been, I know you invited yeah, them the, in. And the mulch company, um, you asked for larger maps um, uh, that you could peers. read because you couldn't read the map that they gave you. So um, last information I had from Rick is we're still waiting on them to provide that to you. Okay. All righty, uh, public hearing, public hearing 2897, uh, open public hearing, now that's been open, uh, Rich take the roll please. Charles Duran. Here. Charles Ladd. Here. Nick Lefakis. Here. Mary Scott. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Ken Nelson. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Sarah Gruber. Here. Guillermo Salazar. Here. And Rich Suzak is here. Okay, now, Roger, this is a special permit, <coughs> and it, it needs to be tabled, but uh, now we're waiting on... Yeah, the, uh, as, a, as a result of us circulating the plan prior to the first public hearing, 
Um, there were comments received from the health department and other agencies that um, the uh, uh, Fahey Landolina law firm that represents the applicant uh, requested that the application be tabled because they didn't want to be before you without those questions answered. Uh, yesterday we received from the health department an approval for a bathroom over the garage. Um, and uh, there are still outstanding issues with uh, the um, fire marshal. So they're still working through uh, trying to work out their issues uh, before they come back to you and they recognize that if at some point in time they may have to withdraw the application if they don't have the, the information they're going to need. Okay, now uh, on January 30th, we got the, the note to grant 35-day extension and uh, there's no the mandatory put the closing date is 3-8, so we three have eight, plenty so of time. You have time. Okay, so as soon as I open it to the public. Uh, two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Anyone in the public would like to speak in favor against this application? Anyone in the public would like to speak in favor against this application? Last call to speak in favor against the application. Motion would be in order to table it to next week. I'm table sorry, it to weeks. your next meeting if they have the information available then they can come forward if they don't okay so the next, make meeting. A the next meeting is three one so you don't have two two meetings you can extend it to yeah they got it's going to have to go forward next meeting okay and if they don't they you're either going to have to deny it without prejudice or they're going to have to so withdraw. the motion would be to uh, three three one, three, three, one. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion that we table public hearing 2897 to our next meeting on March 1st. Second. Motion's made and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. No abstentions. Okay. Public hearing 2879. Uh, um, Secretary, this has been opened. Secretary, please take the roll. Charles Duran. Here. Charles Ladd. Here. Nick Lefakis. Here. Mary Scott. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Ken Nelson. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Sarah Gruber. Here. Guillermo Salazar. Here. And Rich Suzak is here. This is a note from Smith and Bishop LLC from Paul Smith, uh, Timothy Smith, the Gwendolyn Bishop, February 9th, 2018, uh, to Roger O'Brien, the town planner. Uh, concerning villages subdivision and special use permit rehearing 38 lots subdivision and revised to 36 lots Simon Road Enfield public hearing 2879 dear Roger the continued hearing on the above matter is scheduled for March 1st 2018 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission the applicant would respectfully request the continued hearing be scheduled for April 5th 2018 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission the additional time is necessary to allow the applicant to prepare additional maps and information and file those documents with the planning department well in advance of the hearing. Very truly yours, Paul Smith. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we accept the continuation of public hearing um, 2879 to our April 5th meeting. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? Is that going to affect our? So what that would mean is that you will, you, you'll have that one meeting to get all your information out because um, they will have used up their 65 days worth of extensions. Um, so uh, if you close that public hearing, on that day then you'll have another 65 days to deliberate but you can't hear from the applicant or the public after that so uh, it will be important that uh, all the questions that you raised at the last meeting are addressed at that at that at that meeting what but couldn't we 
deny it without prejudice and they refile? Or? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm just saying. I yes, mean, absolutely. If you're, it, if you're, if so you're, uh, uh, well, I mean, but you. you you would have to close the public hearing, and then you have to deliberate because you don't deliberate. But we the couldn't take anything new if there were questions. That right. Way. So, um, yeah, the important thing is that um, the commission is not supposed to um, express an opinion or deliberate during the public hearing. You're supposed to ask questions, solicit information, and then after the public hearing is closed, to deliberate amongst yourself. So. If you have all the information you need, you have 65 days to deliberate, and you can ask staff additional questions, and we can provide you additional information related to information already in the record. Um, so I'm saying at that meeting, if it's, if we don't get answers to things, if you don't get answers, uh, you the what you would do is close the public hearing, and then if you could. Uh, deliberate that night and deny without prejudice, or you could take it up in two weeks. But all I'm saying is it shortens it so that the the onus is going to be really on the applicant to come forward with uh, with all of the questions to to present information that is, uh, that is responsive. I mean. That's not to say that, you know, you still have to evaluate that information, but at least if all of the information is in the record, then you have 65 days to review that information and deliberate amongst yourself. That's presupposing yourself. he has all, all the answers that one particular night. Well, it's, I'm, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying is that it's, people it, it's how, if you they, don't have the information you need, then that will come out during your deliberations. Yeah, but we can't deliberate and then uh, uh, close the meeting and then deliberate and then decide we need additional information. That's well, you can't, I mean, the, the, if you don't accept his, re, his granting of another extension, then you're saying you, he's got to come back sooner than that. And if he needs the time to actually well, answer it. We're trying to find out it. the legal way because yeah. we're, we'd be right up against the time. Right. To give him time to answer the questions, but also to give us time to deliberate properly. The good news is there probably won't be a snowstorm in April, so. <laughs> no, I know that. One never well, knows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, so then the only thing we could do is, if they need additional information is needed, is to deny it without prejudice and have them refile. Right. I mean, I I think that all of the questions we tried we tried to make sure, and I think uh, is even uh, Vice Chair complimented Liz for getting into the minutes. So a lot of the questions you yeah. have, I know other commissioners have said that they were going to get me a list. Um, so we don't want to be distributing that on a group email, but any commissioner can send me a a list of questions that you have that I can provide to the applicant that says you're going to have, these are answer, these are, this is information that, you know, the, the commission would like to receive um, so that they are aware of all the information. I think they should be based on the last hearing. So, but if there are any clarifying things, then I would I would ask well, the commission we'll to send happens, send me I'd an email. Like to be prepared, but that's and okay. then they need to be prepared. Okay. So I don't know if you voted on that motion or not. Mr. No, we Chair. haven't. That's I just wanted to find out. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, granting extension. It's unanimous. No abstentions. And no noes. Okay. New business, uh, new public hearing, 80, 80 Weymouth School Road. Did the applicant present? Did the secretary please take the roll and uh, read the legal notice? Charles Duran. Here. Charles Ladd. Here. Nick Lefakis. Here. Mary Scott. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Ken Nelson. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Sarah Gruber. <coughs> here. Guillermo Salazar. Here. And Rich Suzak is here. Okay. The Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, February 15th, 2018 at 7 p.m. in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, concerning the following application. Public hearing 2898, 80 Weymouth Road, 
School Road, special permit application to expand a non-conforming structure, Danielle and Matthew Mucci, owners, applicants, MAP 68, lot 159, R88 zone. Dated is 12th day of February 2018, Charles Duren, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if I could just tee this up before the applicant comes in. It's, um, this application is one, one of those ones that fits the no good deed goes unpunished. Right. <laughs> uh, so when the, uh, when the applicant submitted their original application, um, they went to the building department, filed, and, and got a sketch of their property from many years ago. Uh, and we accepted in planning that sketch um, in lieu of a formal drawing. And the sketch that was submitted that this commission acted on um, had a measurement of the front yard. Um, the applicant subsequently submitted an A2 survey um, and that A2 survey said there was a substantial difference between what the sketch that was on file in the building department was and what the actual measurement was. Um, so I think, uh, so the only way that um, this project could move forward was to have them come back before this commission um, under a different provision of the regulations which says that, which allows you to uh, um, allow a, a uh, non-conforming structure to be expanded. And so that's, that's why it's here. Um, obviously, if you approve the, um, the in-law apartment uh, the first time around, um, I, we, we would hope that you would approve it this time around. Um, and um, I certainly appreciate the applicant's understanding of um, the fact that, you know, we just, once we got the A2 survey that demonstrated that the information before you the first time was inac inac inaccurate, then this step was necessary. So um, the, and the resolution we also ask you to extend the time frame for filing the original special permit because that couldn't be filed because they couldn't submit a final set of plans um, consistent with that original approval. So I consider what you have before you housekeeping details that allows uh, these folks to move forward with um, the um, in-law apartment um, uh, as they hope. Roger, I notice on your uh, your memo uh, that it's in one one form. Uh, is that best, or should it be two two votes? Uh, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I know that. Um, Jen and I talked about it, and we put it into one. Uh, if you feel there's two motions have been necessary, the reason why that I put it into one um, is that uh, we didn't advertise this as a rehearing for the original okay. thing, and we're just basically acknowledging that you did approve a special permit, you set a time for it to be filed, and you're now, and people have come back and asked for um, an extension, so yeah, it's all one true. project. Well, that would be up to the mm. person that makes a motion and let yeah. it go with that. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Sorry to have you come back. That's well, okay. <laughs> Excuse my voice. I have a sinus thing. Um, so, as Roger said, that's. Oh, I'm Danielle Musi from 80 Weymouth School Road. I'm Serge Lassard. I'm the g general contractor. Um, as Roger pointed out, is that when we first came, we had a sketch from um, building department. And then when we got the A2 survey to confirm the um, outside Dimension. dimensions, it came to us that we were only um, a certain amount of feet from the road instead of the requirements for a conforming lot. Okay, questions? 
Uh, we're, it's not um, making the non-conforming use any worse than what's currently there, right? Right. And they got the map from the town of Enfield that we approved originally. Right. Mm -hmm. I find no fault of the homeowner at all, and oh, I'm good with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Plus, that's not really a high traffic traffic road either, so right. it's not like it's going to cause tr problems with traffic or that sort of thing. Nope. Okay. Because the only thing I want to confirm is we're not going to do the addition on, I guess, on the, the west side. Um, we're, we're just going to do the, the two car garage in, in the middle no, lot. We're Going to still do the addition. No, the addition, the addition uh, doesn't require formal action right. by the uh, commission as long as it lines up with zoning. Then they go directly to the uh, building permit, uh, building permit process, and we review it and sign it off as a building permit. And it was actually in order to file for the building permit on the addition that they had to get the survey. Which then, when we looked at the survey, it also impacted what you approved and that's why I say no good deed goes unpunished all right um, so, so they, they are doing both additions. they are both doing both, on both uh, sides so of the house. it's on there so you know what they're doing but it doesn't require any formal action from you all right yeah there are two votes which are uh, contained in the the memo one's the extension uh, to file the special permit and the other is the uh, Special permit to expand a non-conforming structure. Well, actually, technically, uh, rethinking that be because it didn't meet the front by approving the expansion of non, you are allowing them to also go to the building department on the addition. Mm -hmm. So I stand corrected. This action tonight is necessary for the addition as well. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, then I'll close. Public hearing 2898. 2887. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, anyone in the public wish? I'm sorry. In fact, you got an 87 here, 97 there. 20, are you got 28. Oh, that was the previously approved one. Anyone in the public would like to speak in favor against this hearing? Anyone in the public would like to speak in favor against this? Last call to speak in favor or against. I didn't see anyone in the public who needed this one. <laughs> okay. Then I'll officially close 2898. Mary? Resolution would approve the, um, the expansion of the non conforming building and it would also extend the time frame to file the previous special permit I'd like to make a motion um, that we extend the deadline to file the special permit for public hearing 2898 and that we um, approve the expansion of a non-conforming structure um, for public hearing 2898. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Actually, it's 2887 that you're extending the deadline on. So that's a that's our fault. 2887, yeah. And just a question: Is that going to include the was the motion to adopt the the draft resolution by the planning department and all the conditions in it? With that motion? That's yeah, probably. 2887 is this with all the. Yeah. It's 28, it, this one is 2898, yeah. and that's why the rest refers to 2887. So, yes, you should refer to this, uh, this, uh, we need to reference yeah. the, that's right. this Resolution draft. Yeah. Okay, so make a motion to, to, <laughs> to approve public hearing 2898 um, and the draft resolution that's dated February 15, 2018, with 25 conditions, um, whereas we're approving the expansion of a non-conforming structure. Second. No, the motion's made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Mary, what, are you in favor? Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Any Sorry, opposed? No abstentions, unanimous. I think, unless 
She was being polite. Yeah, right, well, okay. <coughs> oh, all right, I see why she's not. Okay. I think you're good this time, okay. Danielle. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> No, that it was included in both of the finally. That's what we were after. Okay. Uh, other business presentation discussion update on River Gateway. <laughs> on your table tonight, you should have the uh, printout. So if this is going out over the air, we don't have to put down the presentation screen, right? Because there's nobody here. No. Oh, because it will show right. up on there. You're right. Maybe yeah. Peter wants to see it. Yeah, Pete. We've seen it. We don't even have Right. We don't need it. Oh, good. We are going anywhere. Yay! <laughs> Hey, Roger, uh, should I just jump into it? or? Yeah, well, I, I guess I can just have an introduction. I sent out a little note to you, uh, to the commission this afternoon. I know everybody doesn't catch up with their emails, but um, this is, uh, and Peter Bryanton is here with us tonight, and Peter was the uh, gentleman who uh, secured the funds from the state uh, who to uh, conduct uh, He's a this, money man, huh? the, to conduct this, and has we've been working very closely with with Peter on this, uh, and uh, this portion of it, um, um, I think this is the first time that we've we've had a public meeting with uh, Francisco on this. Um, we, I mean. Uh, in terms of being filmed, we've had the a couple of workshops where he's presented uh, to the commission, and what uh, the first the first couple of slides reiterates what the commission worked with to develop as far as the goals of this study. Uh, the River Gateway area goes all the way from the Connecticut River, uh, includes the train station. Um, so the river is a gateway and the train station is a gateway. Uh, we were limited to study within, um, correct me, Peter, a half mile, a half mile of the train station. Um, and what we, what we endeavored to do is to um, pick two or three sites in the study area and say, uh, what can you do under the existing zoning? Uh, the existing zoning in the area right now is either uh, Thompsonville Village A or Thompsonville Village B or R33 or in this one, one portion of the site's an industrial one. And uh, what Francisco has been, was charged with is to pick out two or three sites <coughs> and say, okay, what, what could you do under the existing zoning that's in a place, uh, in place, and he will tell you not much. And then uh, if we were to contemplate allowing um, additional um, development, and as you know, the whole goal of transit-oriented development was to try to uh, capitalize on the existence of the transportation and say that we might want to allow a higher density use. Um, so therefore, we tried to indicate areas where we might be able to allow, allow a higher density use. Uh, all of the suggestions in this tonight are uh, just examples of things. They, they're not proposals. Uh, nowhere in here are we saying the town is going to go out and knock down buildings and create parking lots or anything else. This is an opportunity to talk about the types of things that we might envision to take place there. Uh, and if we did, uh, start the, the conversation about what kind of design standards. Um, so with that introduction, I would turn it over to Francisco. Okay. Thank you, Roger. All right. Uh, I'd like to provide a brief overview expanding upon... Probably should say for the record, who are you? I'm sorry. For the record, Francisco Gomes with Fitzgerald and Halliday. 
Uh, we are the consultant hired by the town on this aspect of the project. Uh, this complements uh, the other half of the project, which is the market analysis, uh, which was done by Forward Planning. And, and they're more or less uh, complete with their work. And that uh, market analysis is very informative to the work that we're doing, which is why we're kind of following them uh, with our work. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll refer to the, some of the findings of, of that work uh, uh, throughout uh, this presentation. Um, a brief review of, of what it is that uh, we're going to deliver to you and to the town. Uh, we've conducted a review of prior plans and studies, and um, these first couple slides are going to be familiar to those of you who attended the workshop uh, a couple of months ago. I, I gave a similar introduction. Um, uh, there's been a lot of planning done for this area, for Thompsonville, for the River Gateway area. Uh, there have been years, really uh, decades now, a couple decades of planning. And uh, we wanted to uh, understand what had been done in the past, the ideas that had been entertained, and the efforts that had been put forward uh, so that we could carry forward uh, some of the good ideas and, and understand uh, why uh, some ideas may not have, have been uh, implemented. Uh, so that we've, we've done uh, that pretty exhaustive research and, and provided uh, Roger with a memo of, of some of our findings. And I think most of that information will be very familiar to you. Uh, we are also uh, going to evaluate the procedures, regulations, and permitting uh, relative to projects and planning and zoning uh, to make sure you have a process that's serving you well. And we're going, uh, with all of our work, it, we're going to deliver a document and a product that uh, has some graphic information that's illustrative and uh, helps uh, you and the general public understand some of the basic concepts uh, such as uh, a setback or FAR, uh, et cetera. We are also trying to address the following issues with uh, your zoning document and ordinance. Uh, we want to update any definitions pertaining to the River Gateway area, so it's very clear what we're referencing in the ordinance. Uh, simplify use tables and reduce footnotes and exemptions. Uh, incorporate design guidelines into the zoning document. The Thompsonville area has its own design guidelines, which are a separate doc document that are referenced by the ordinance. Uh, to the greatest extent possible, we want to take whatever's most valuable in that and incorporate it into the ordinance so that there aren't two separate guiding documents. Um, as I mentioned, it, we want it to be illustrative so that it's user-friendly. And uh, we want to address uh, some key uh, design considerations such as height restrictions. Uh, we we want to revisit those for the River Gateway area. So our ongoing work right now, where we're at right now in this process, is that we've evaluated the land uses and compared that to your existing zoning. Um, we've assessed the fiscal impact of some different development types, and, and I'll walk you through that. Uh, and we've provided a build-out analysis of three sites in the Thompsonville or River Gateway area, which Roger spoke to. These are hypothetical scenarios. Um, and uh, we, what we want to do with that is identify how the zoning uh, might be able to change to support the vision uh, that you as a community have for the River Gateway area. So let me start, let me go back to the past. Uh, this is about 80 years ago. Uh, 1935, and I, I'm not sure how well it reads on your monitor there, but this is an aerial photograph taken in 1935 of Thompsonville. Uh, the state has an incredible collection of aerial photographs from 1935 that are amazingly high resolution. It's not quite Google Earth, but for the time, it's, it's amazing. And uh, it's statewide coverage. You can go online and see it, but this is really a nice glimpse into the past. And as you can see in here, does, does my cursor show up on the screen? Good, yeah. good. Uh, Bigelow Commons is, is clearly the driving factor of this neighborhood. Uh, there, are, there is likely one job there for every household within the half mile radius that we are now studying. And um, the railroad also being a driver, of course. The Bigelow Commons wouldn't be there without the railroad uh, there. Um, 
most of that housing uh, was built prior to 1935. As you can see, the area looks remarkably similar uh, to the way it looks today in an aerial photograph. And there are areas that up here, uh, Hartford Avenue area, that was in the aerial photograph, we were to zoom in on it, you could see it was very fresh, recently built. So that was built sometime in the late 20s or early 30s. Uh, so it, it's always very informative to look to the past to see how it can inform where we are now. And uh, I, I think what it tells us is uh, that uh, the, the mill was really the heart of this community and it, and it drove all the development in this community. And to the extent that you had a thriving uh, retail or commercial district once upon a time, it was very much a function of the hundreds or thousands of jobs that were at the mill and all of the activity generated uh, by that mill. Okay. So that's what's very different today. You, fortunately, the, the mill has been reinvented into a, a very active site of a different nature, uh, you know, it being residences. Um, it, is, it, it being residential, it probably has half as much, if not less, activity in terms of foot traffic and comings and goings than it once had. So our, our challenge here is to plan for an area that doesn't have uh, the same kind of economic driver in it, that has external economic drivers where, where uh, jo the jobs are out and people are coming in to live. It, it's been turned inside out, okay? Uh, we, we did uh, a land use study of the area, really trying to dig into the details of it. And I, I'm not sure how well you can see this on the screen, but uh, there are a few generations of development here, but almost everything happened prior to 1930. Uh, and, and much of it happened really between 1890s and 1930, uh, probably three quarters of the development in, the, in this area. Uh, and the development types range quite a bit. Uh, single family homes, duplexes, three and four family homes, uh, small apartment buildings, apartment over retail and office, and of course the converted industrial Bigelow Commons. Uh, Probably multifamily is, is the most common housing type in, in this area with a lot of fourplexes, uh, uh, two, three, and, and fourplexes as a really interesting model we don't see in every community. Um, so that's, that your history is one of multifamily development. And, and the reason being this was workforce housing. You know, this was blue collar housing. And uh, it was far more affordable to share a house with someone if you're earning a, a, a a working man's wage. Excuse me. A lot of yes. those homes were actually built by the factory. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would imagine so. Yeah. Hartford Avenue, Bigelow An Avenue, Pleasant Street, um, Martin. Yeah, the, the Hartford Avenue area, and I've got, I've got a slide of that area specifically. That, and that's probably one of the, the nicest uh, housing forms or house, highest quality housing forms or type in, in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of size and just quality of build. So your existing, which uh, it is, has some interesting functions in that you have uh, a village center zoning, which is actually quite flexible. Uh, that is really surrounded by this R33 zone, which is quite inflexible. Uh, the special SDD, Special Design District for Bigelow Commons, it, it really allows for a lot of the same things that the Village Center Zone allows. Uh, so there's, there's some structure here that we're building off of in our recommendations. And you know, I look forward to any feedback you might have. So let me advance to our, the vision that we've established working with Roger and his staff. And, and this comes out of feedback we received from our workshop last time. And it's something we're certainly looking to receive some feedback from you on as well. But that vision builds off of what uh, some of the zoning you already have. And what we're trying to do more than anything else is, uh, first of all, simplify it. Uh, second, create new opportunities. And, and third, have it just be more consistent with the land form and development types and land use that you have right now. So we propose our four districts within uh, our study area. Um, a mixed-use district which shows in orange and that uh, pretty much covers 
the Bigelow Commons area, your existing retail areas along Main Street, North Main Street, um, and a couple of areas along Route 5 that are close to on either side of where we are uh, right now that, that fall within what we would consider to be the River Gateway uh, area. Looking to where those zones would keep going to or continue to, uh, what we're recommending is to, to carry them north, south, and east to some pretty natural boundaries. Uh, to the north, you have um, uh, a cemetery and quite a bit of open space associated with some wetlands and, and some slopes there. Uh, so the northern extents of this would probably be Pearson Way, which is the housing authority property. To the east, Route 5 is a very logical uh, boundary. Uh, to the south, uh, Route 190 uh, is as well a logical boundary. And then, of course, Connecticut River to the west. Uh, that uh, covers our study area and extends slightly beyond it, but in a, in a rational way. Okay. Um, one of the things that we wanted to get our heads wrapped around was, and, and this really stems from a couple comments or concerns we heard at a prior workshop or presentation about density. You know, a question I was specifically asked was, uh, are you going to increase density in Thompsonville? And uh, at, the, at the time, I don't think we were really prepared to give a firm answer to that question. Uh, because we needed to understand what the density is right now. And, and of course, if you build one house in, in Thompsonville, you're increasing density. So the question is, well, what's there now and, and how much uh, can you tolerate and, and what's your perspective on density? So we, we did this exercise and, and I want to share it with you and, re and really get your feedback. Um, so we asked ourselves, what are, what are the densities found in, in the River Gateway area and how does that compare to what it is allowed by the existing zoning? Um, Hartford and Bigelow Avenues, here's the, uh, the image I, I referred to. These average at about 10 units per acre, which is not real, real dense. You know, it's not dense by urban standards, but you know, by suburban standards, it's it's dense. Uh, compared to Bigelow, uh, which has a lot of housing units, uh, Bigelow actually comes in at 20 units per acre. Uh, despite having a lot of housing units, it does have a decent amount of open space and parking areas, et cetera, that that keep that density from from getting too high. Yeah, Francisco, if I could just point out that 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 uh, that area that you just mentioned with the Hartford and Bigelow Avenue with the 10 yes. units of density it's zoned R33 right now which is um, you know three quarter acre one house three quarter acre so all of that housing which is there and isn't going to change and gets to Commissioner Swizak's point. So what we one of the things we're proposing is that the new zone that would go on there would make all of those houses conforming as opposed to non-conforming, so that we'd actually allow what is there and has existed for a long, long time uh, to be conforming. Um, somewhere along the line, the town decided to upzone the whole area, which, and then put in into place in your zoning regulations. Like, well, if you're non-conforming in an R33, you have to do this. If you're conforming in an R33, you have to do that. So what we're proposing here is to would take that neighborhood and other neighborhoods as well, and we would create a zone that actually reflects what's there. If you, were give, if you were given a wrecking ball and tasked with making this neighborhood conforming, you, you'd have to go in and take down 85% of the houses to make it conforming. So I think you have to ask yourself, is the existing zoning you have in place uh, serving uh, this neighborhood well? Right. All right, the, the freshwater pond area, uh, that comes in at 10 units per acre, and, and these are, uh, you know, apartments kind of townhouse style uh, apartments. Uh, Elo, Elo Grasso Manor, which is a housing authority property, is around the same density, 17 units per acre. And these are 
I, I think what you might call kind of a garden style uh, apartments. As Nantuck Street, these are at 12 units per acre, not a, a real high density. Um, but I think there is a perception in this area that it, it things feel dense or for whatever reason. It may, it may be related to the setback. You can see in the image of the house, there's a, a, a really shallow setback, which perhaps add to, adds to that perception of it being a very dense area. So, uh, you know, what we found was that you really have a range uh, of density, but a lot of it was up around between 10 and 20 units per acre throughout much of the River Gateway area. Um, and to understand what uh, the R33 zone, how that really might look around town, we looked further beyond uh, the River Gateway area around town, trying to find some examples of something that might actually conform with R33. And so we just picked a few random locations. Um, this home on Connecticut Avenue, uh, it actually came in at five units per acre, given the lot sizes on that street, which is 3.8 times too dense for the R33 district. Uh, I believe this area is R33 as well. This house on Laurel Street, uh, two units per acre, one and a half times too dense for R33. And we finally found one that, after the third try, one that conformed, and this house on Parker Street at one unit per acre. So we're finally at something that would be allowed in R33. So uh, you know, I'm trying to impress upon you that R33 is highly restrictive, and if you're interested in, in any sort of revitalization of Thompsonville, uh, you're prob we're probably gonna need to look beyond this existing uh, district and its density regulations. All right, so what well, does... It's not so much density, it's design. It, and, it's and, design, and, and, it's and, density, it, it's uh, Well, it's not setback, density, it's density, parking. it's with the lot area you would need, but yeah. not necessarily the density and the design standards. Yes. Because we wouldn't actually be increasing the density, we would just be allowing the same density to be configured in a different design. Yes. So what does density look like with different types of housing? And, and so we have a few examples of images from all around the country of different types of housing. Uh, this is something that you probably have seen a few houses like this in, in Enfield. This is two units per acre. That's what it looks like. Uh, another type of house, two units per acre. Here that we can see the houses are a little closer together, four units per acre. Once again, uh, smaller houses uh, closer together, kind of a village type feel, four units per acre. Here we have a duplex, so we, we're more or less doubling that uh, density at eight units per acre. Uh, single family houses in a traditional New England neighborhood uh, spaced very closely. This is actually Newport, uh, eight units per acre. Uh, town house uh, style development with the attached houses, uh, 12 units per acre. So as soon as we start attaching houses, our, our densities can go up quite a bit. Uh, another concept of about the same density. Uh, each house has its own garage, its own driveway, its own front door entrance. Uh, this is a fourplex uh, house which you have some examples of, minus the garage, right? In the, uh, the Hartford Avenue, Bigelow Avenue areas, the houses are more or less this size. And, and this is around 12 units per acre. Um, 15 units per acre as you start to attach more of these units together. Uh, this is townhouse style development at 15 units per acre as well. Uh, these are, are often, these types of apartment buildings I'm showing you now can get up to around 20 units per acre. They're sometimes called uh, mansion buildings. Uh, you really design an apartment building to look like an extremely large home and, uh, and it can have multiple dwelling units within it. 
And then a more traditional apartment building with some lower level retail, around 30 units per acre. Uh, exclusively residential, that you can increase the density to around 40 units per acre with this type of housing. Uh, once again, around 40 units per acre. This is more of a waterfront environment. And uh, in more of an urban context, you, you can get up to 80 units per acre. I think this example is from Stanford, uh, where we have uh, four floors of residential over retail on the bottom. And uh, this example is from stores, the Stores Center, which was built a couple of years ago. Uh, four floors of residential over retail, also around 80 units per acre. An another picture from the Stores Center. And uh, if you're all residential, uh, five floors, you can get up to around 100 units per acre. So the densities can range quite a bit, uh, depending on uh, the type of, of structure. And, and obviously, the design affects the perception of, of that architecture as well. So beyond the density, good streets and neighborhoods are a function of density and design. So design is a really important factor. You know, I showed you some examples of 40, 80, 100 units per acre. Well, I have some examples that are far less dense than that. Uh, this is 17 units per acre, only three stories. Two stories, 16 units per acre. And uh, this is kind of two and a half stories. It's half a story of wall and two stories of roof at 13 units per acre. So here we have densities that are similar to what you have in the Thompsonville area, perhaps even a little lower, uh, but look very different. So uh, this is the role of design and, and potentially of some design guidelines to ensure that even if you were to allow 15 units per acre, that you don't end up with one of these, which I'm assuming that you might not like. Maybe, maybe you do like it. Um, but this would not be consistent with... I like with those basement windows. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're efficient, Roger, in terms, you know, this time of year, there's not a lot of cold air coming through there. Um, so this may not be what your vision of, of Thompsonville or the River Gateway area, I should say, is. Okay. So the point here is, is that it, it's, it's not necessarily density, it's, de it's density along with design standards. So you can't have, you really got to look at both ends of that equation. Right. I think one of the things though about density, I mean, I love the visuals of seeing all these different types of dense housing, mm -hmm. but a major issue for me and I think for Thompsonville is just the parking. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we can have the most beautiful lawn and the most beautiful designed um, apartment complex, but if everyone's parking on the street and it's very hard to get around and it's congested, mm -hmm then it's really difficult to make that a desirable place to want to walk to the train station or want to walk to whatever yeah. mixed use you put there. So I think that's really important. You're, you're in parking something we're going to take a look at in, in, with the ordinance. Uh, the, right now, the uh, Thompsonville Village Center ordinance doesn't require an applicant to provide off-street parking if they can demonstrate that uh, parking needs can be met with other with on-street or municipal resources so there's a lot of a lot of flexibility the applicant has i mean ultimately you have to approve it um but i i think we're we we're trying to balance between your neighborhood being full of parking lots or <laughs> being or having standards that are absolutely prohibitive of development and ending up with streets that are congested and, and not being able to park in front of your own house. So we're, we're, our challenge is to find that balance. And I could tell you as a community, you're certainly, uh, this is not a unique to you, a problem unique to you. We're working right now with the town of Greenwich specifically on parking. Uh, in their, we're updating their commercial zoning, uh, their commercial zone parking requirements and standards uh, because uh, parking's an issue. They're at the same time they are concerned about deterring development and scaring off uh, potential retail customers for Greenwich Avenue, and uh, 
or ending up with no place to park and just chaos. Uh, so we're, we are, we're very capable at assisting you with that, and, and it's something we definitely plan on doing, and an issue we plan on addressing. All right, so I'd like to talk just a little bit more about density, about some of the value of density. And, and of course, there's a lot of negative associations with density, and, and I think we already know what those associations are. But uh, the value of density is that density supports local businesses. And as I mentioned, uh, it, it was really a very successful Bigelow, a very successful mill in all the housing around it that made uh, the retail environment and the storefronts and the main street uh, possible that you had once upon a time uh, in, in its heyday. And with, without the, the amount of activity and density and foot traffic, uh, it, you, you would have had to half the storefronts, um, if that. So the, one of the values of density is supporting uh, local businesses and goods and services. If you, if you want to have those locally, uh, you can't be the only customer. Uh, Density adds to grand list value and property tax revenue, so it, it, it's, it's positive uh, for the town. There are costs that uh, come with that density, and the first thing that people think of is uh, you know, educating children and infrastructure costs and maintenance costs. The thing about the River Gateway area is that the infrastructure is already there. The sewer mains have already been put in and paid for. The water mains have been paid for. You're still paying to maintain them. All the maintenance is still happening, so whether or not you have 10% more housing and 10% greater population in the area, you have st already incurred the cost and continue to incur the cost of maintaining the infrastructure there to support it. So there's a certain value in, in being a higher density. And for the school question, it's, it's really unique to every town, uh, whether or not uh, some, many, many towns in Connecticut are actually desperate to put children in, in seats because they, are at, they have a teacher in a classroom, whether it's halfway full or full. Uh, so that's, that's, another, uh, uh, that's a whole other issue to be addressed. I can say this, most of the new housing, multifamily housing construction in Connecticut uh, attracts, um, it attracts people who don't have children. It, it has a very low uh, a very low population of children relative to a traditional neighborhood of single family houses or duplexes. Uh, so while we may be talking about with any given development, uh, a lot of units, 100 units, you're probably not gonna get 200 kids. You're probably gonna get 10, okay? All right, so uh, another value of density is that it both supports and is supported by transit, which is a driving factor of this project. Uh, you will hopefully have a train station here in the next five years or so. And uh, uh, that train station will make it possible uh, for people to commute to this labor neighborhood, live in this neighborhood, uh, potentially live in this neighborhood with maybe one less car per household than they might have if the train station wasn't there. And uh, of course, that transit service is going to need riders. So to the extent that people can live in, within walking distance of train stations, that, that's a good thing. This example, this graphic I have, is a great example from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy on what you need to have a local market, a, a grocery market, and not necessarily a, a big supermarket, but a grocery market in any neighborhood. And within a half mile radius, which coincides with, with our study area, uh, you need to have a density that averages out to 40 dwelling units per acre. Now that's the average uh, because uh, it's discounting for land that's used for open space and commercial uses, et cetera. Uh, but basically you need to build residential to around 40 units uh, per acre so that you average 12, 20 dwelling units per acre. Uh, now that's how you support a, a market within, almost with the, entirely within that radius. Of course, if you're attracting customers from outside, you need lower densities. But the point being that it, if you want to be able to sustain some of the businesses that you have uh, in Thompsonville, uh, the markets, the retail stores, you, you, you need people within proximity. And uh, you, you can't count on these people to drive past the Enfield Mall and all the retail you have over there and all the retail you have on Route 5 to come here to do business. 
you need to draw customers from west of that, right, where they would have to pass the retail, pass through and buy the retail uh, in Thompsonville to get to the other places. So your, your challenge here is getting enough customers. If you want to sustain a retail environment, is getting enough customers on this side of all that other re retail. Right, so that's, that's the challenge. And, and that's generally supported by the market work that Ford Planning, Todd Poole had done, was they showed us the retail environment is real tepid for that exact reason. Uh, right now, you know, a lot of those, those customers have a lot of options within a 15 mile drive time or even a five mile drive time. All right, now on to our case study sites. So in order to understand what is, what could be accommodated within our study area, if we were to think outside the box of your existing zoning and density, we, we just needed to pick some demonstration sites, if you want to call them that. Uh, so we chose three areas, uh, and this came from consulta consultation with Roger and Peter and Michael. Um, one area being the Main Street, Pleasant, Chapel, Church Block uh, area uh, where the Strand Theater is. Um, another area being Keller Avenue where the Town Enfield uh, Building and Grounds facility is along with some adjacent parcels. And uh, in addition to that, um, uh, an industrial site on Prospect Street. So uh, as Roger had mentioned, these are hypothetical scenarios for the purpose of understanding what uh, these properties are feasible of accommodating, and these are not recommended development plans. So first of all, the, uh, the Main Street block, uh, there's a community center there, um, uh, the Strand Theater, which I think we all know is boarded up, and then there's also uh, to the south, a community health center, and I think some of that building may still be vacant. Um, so uh, all of these parcels combined equal about three acres. There's 14 parcels in total. Right now, the total assessed value is a little over two million. And uh, all of these properties combined um, generate about $33,000 a, a year in tax revenue. And, and so I'll, I'll reference some of these just so that we can compare the, imp, the fiscal implications of what different development types have versus uh, what's there right now. So we had, we laid out um, with working within the town, this, and I should note this is in the TVC, the Thompsonville Village Center zone, which is actually quite flexible, but does have some basic setback standards. And so I had one of our staff lay out, uh, well, what could we fit? If we were to rebuild most of this area, save the theater and, and the community center, uh, what could we fit on the site according to uh, the existing regulations and, and some of the parcel lines that are there? Uh, so we're somewhat limited by the setbacks, but they're, they're not too aggressive in the TVC. A lot of flexibility. More than anything, we're constrained by parking. Right? You, you just, it's very difficult to park. And uh, we could count on a little bit on street, but we need to get some on site as well. And so we figured we could get about 10 buildings in here. They would, because of the parking limitations, they would be restricted to one floor each. So one story buildings. And uh, running the numbers on these, it would be maybe a total of two million or so of assessed value. So, you'd be kind of be replacing what you already have, uh, and it would generate uh, about 72,000 a year in annual property taxes. Now, the other way is to think outside the box, say, okay, what if, what if we could forget about the existing zoning, and what if we could assemble parcels? Um, and what if the economics would support something more ambitious? So here we have, in, in place of the community health center building, a three-story building, a little over 50,000 square feet. The real issue here is that with that size of a building, uh, you really have to provide a lot of parking, okay? Uh, so what we see here is you need about 170 uh, parking spaces, and, and this is accounting for if you want to re reuse the Strand Theater. 
Now, I don't know how many seats are in the Strand Theater, but let's say it's 300. 700. It's, it's uh, twice that. Okay, for a theater, you need, uh, and this is a pretty uh, uniform parking standard you'll see in, in many, many communities. For a theater, you need one parking space for every three seats, okay? So that tells me that, what, we need 200 uh, parking, you know, more than 250, 250 parking spaces uh, for the theater. So even with this, even by tearing down all of the rest of the properties, and even if that building were sharing uh, parking with the theater, and, and presumably if you were to build a, an office building, retail building with some housing, there'd be an opportunity to share parking with something like a theater that might have uh, hours where, where the, the other uses aren't using the parking. Even then, it, it's very difficult to accommodate all, all the uses on this site. But with the building of this size, uh, you could really uh, add some value uh, to, to the site, to the block, and you'd bring the, potentially bring the assessed value up to $3 million, and that's not including if you were to improve the theater. And so you we're raising what the, the block would uh, raise in, in property taxes. Now, because this is probably not a desirable scenario to have tear down a, a bunch of buildings to turn half the block into parking, uh, we, we it took a look at some other scenarios. So if the economics were supportive of it, you could potentially build just on the community health center site, and there's one building off of Pleasant Avenue you'd, you'd need to take, a four-story building that had a five-level garage because the ground floor of the parking would be underground, so you get that fifth level down there. Uh, and that would accommodate uh, twice as many parking spaces. And you could wrap the building, so the dark gray is the parking, the white's the building. You could wrap three sides of it, so you don't see it from any of the streets. Uh, all you see is a building. And presumably a first floor could be uh, a mix between retail and office with uh, three upper floors of residential. Um, there would be 140 excess spaces that could potentially be used for the Strand Theater. Uh, the assessed value of this type of development would be around 6.5 million, which could generate about $200,000 a year in, in annual property taxes compared to the 30 or so thousand that's generated by this block right now. now if I can just interject on that. If you, yes, go, if you go back to the, uh, the little aerial photograph of that block, two slides back. Yes. Um, the, the building right on the corner has the community health yes, services, correct. which may or may not at any point in time, they're a tenant, they may or may not at any point in time look at other alternatives. Mm -hmm. And then the majority of the one-story building, it's all owned by uh, an LLC out of Massachusetts. The majority of that other building is either vac is vacant or right. a intermittent user on the on the far end. So let's just say that tenant went somewhere else, which is the main tenant in that whole area there, went somewhere else. Then the owner of this building, um, an out-of-state investor, would start and say, well, what am I going to be, what can I do with these buildings as they sit there? And um, as you've pointed out, not really a whole lot can be done there. And so because of the major issue being being parking. Uh, so it's not that the town would be proposing that um, that the town knock down, acquire or knock down the buildings or what have you, but it would say that this is a, this would be an, an option for somebody who might even want to buy it or the existing owner uh, as to what that, the town may want to feel would be appropriate opposite the um, the pond, and since this site is within walking distance of the train station mm -hmm. and the river, uh, that so up until this point we've talked about well let's let's increase density around the train station, but we know there's really few very few places there, but then when you get out and walk. Um, you know, you 
you can you can walk from that site to the train station and not very far five minutes yeah like not very thousand, far feet. yeah it's a thousand feet yeah a thousand feet so um i think you know when we started thinking about that and saying well let's not concentrate on over on the riverfront and you know trying to put houses along the river or something that's going to create that density around the train station but where else might we allow it um and that that's why we come up with the the possibility but also just bear in mind that when you go and look at this little liner building which is the garage wrapped by retail or office or residential whatever you want i mean that little example uh, could be put anywhere on that block or on the block across the street, which is all parking. Um, and I think the next example that um, Francisco has given you, it was just trying to show that if the market's not there to build that garage at the present time, you could still build the building and have an interim parking there. We probably, in reality, wouldn't want to do that because if you went down Pleasant Street, you'd have parking to the left and parking to the right, and that's probably not desirable. But it so that's why we just put the caveat around all of these things. Is like these are examples, but don't take it as we're proposing Pleasant Street to be a parking lot. Um, so. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, Francisco. sure, sure. You can't keep um, me quiet for too long. <laughs> so, the, the the scenario here with the uh, uh, apartment building, I, obviously that would be significantly increasing density. I, I mean, here we're we're talking probably uh, 40 units an acre, or something to that effect. Um, now. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, developers have uh, prefer to go to four or five stories is just economies of scale. Once you put in the foundation and once you put in the heating, cooling system and, and all these expensive attributes, and, and particularly if you have to build a parking deck, uh, every floor you go up gets cheaper and, until you hit a certain threshold. For instance, uh, beyond, you can go up five floors with wood frame construction. And, and then once you get to six, you have to do a podium base, which is concrete or steel construction, and have wood above that, or go to all concrete and steel. Uh, so there's, there's this balance here where with your zoning really needs to achieve a balance between, well, what is it you, you'd like to see in your community, and what do you feel is appropriate to your community? And, and typically, you do that by looking around the community and saying, well, what else is here? And Bigelow Commons has lots of four-story buildings. Uh, and you're balancing that against, well, what's a developer going to be able to afford to build? All right. Uh, the, so the higher they go, the more return on investment they get. So at four stories, it, it, to build anything with a parking structure, they'll, they'll probably want to build five stories, but at, at, at least four, because every spot in a parking structure costs $30,000 to build. Uh, so you have to distribute that across. The more units you have to distribute that across, the, the lower the cost. Um, versus a surface parking, which is about $3,000 of space. Um, so it's very expensive. Um, and and the, the economics of it are difficult. The economics right now um, may not support this type of development. May not. We, uh, there might be a developer who can figure out a way to make it happen. Uh, but it, it's really, if you have the, the regulatory environment in place that will allow them to do so by way of zoning that is supportive of this, it creates an opportunity for them to see if they can make it happen. Okay, let's take a look at another site. Uh, the town uh, owns most of this. We did include three other parcels, one with a, a building that uh, I, I think is probably blighted, um, and two, uh, another vacant parcel to the rear uh, which is up, up here, and there's also a small parcel that has a garage on it, but not, not a housing structure. So this is the blighted building. So combination of four parcels, uh, one and three quarters acres. Uh, right now the total assessed value is 639,000. Um, 
it generates 4900 in, in tax revenue, all four of these parcels, mainly because the, the town site is, is not generating tax revenue. This is in the R33 district. So in R33, all the red you see are your setback requirements. Okay? So on this parcel, you could build a really, really skinny house. Okay? Um, if, you're, if you can live in a house that's 10 feet wide, you could build it. Uh, these two bar parcels here, you can't build anything. This is the only developable parcel, and the most you can get on it is a duplex. So, uh, we end up with 1.2 units per acre. The pointer isn't showing up anymore. Oh, it's not. Let me, let me try the, this. I started using my... How about now? Oh, it's not. Okay. Are you just, I'm going to have to do my best to describe what it is I'm looking at. Okay. So the white pieces were unbuildable. I'm trying to figure out which yeah. colors. All right. Yeah. The white is, is a structure, what you can fit. Okay. Perfect. The green is the area you can build in. And the red is what you can't build in. The red are your setbacks. Okay. So we assemble four parcels and we have 1.73 acres and you can build one building that has two units which is 1.2 units per acre, which is what, you know, your R33 allows that. Uh, the total assessed value here of all the properties combined uh, with, along with the two units is about 350,000 and uh, it would generate around $11,000 in annual property taxes a year. Now, what if the R33 zone didn't exist and we had another zone that was more prohibitive and what if we built townhouses similar to what you see in the image? Well, um, we could potentially connect Keller Avenue to the road to the north and improve circulation in that area, I think, which would be probably a positive thing, a good thing for public safety to have a... Yeah, and there's just too many kind of dead ends. Yeah. Um, well... And it's congested as well, yeah. So, well, of course. Yeah, the 18, 1890s, early 1900s, this was built before the Model T. Yeah. So, uh, in this scenario, we fit 28 townhouse units. And, and so, a townhouse unit is basically defined as the, the dwelling unit. It goes from ground and all the floors above it are one dwelling unit. So you're not stacking different residences on top of each other. Uh, and this is uh, a very common form of development and everyone has a front door to the street. And in this scenario, we show everyone has a driveway and a parking garage as well. Uh, so 28 uh, townhouse units, which brings us up to 16 units per acre. Uh, brings up the assessed value to 2.9 million and we based on that we based that assessed value we took a look at some comparable values in town and we just said well let's say the assessed value of a townhouse is hundred thousand dollars which it kind of checks out with, from what we looked around town at other examples uh, of uh, condos and that sort of thing those are townhouse units facing Prospect Street yeah, yeah. Uh, so now we have a development form that's generating $91,000 a year in annual property taxes you know, based upon the assessed value and your mill rate. Uh, compared to right now, you're generating $4,900 a year, and your current zoning would allow you to generate uh, $11,000 per year. So. You know, fiscally, this would be a, a responsible decision to uh, allow for this type of, of development. And it's also walkable to the train station. Oh, absolutely. Yes. All these examples are walkable to the train station. Which, and, and that's what really might change the market for you here as well. And the third site is a Prospect Street site. It's in the industrial zone. And it is an active industrial property. 4.3 acres. This is three acres combined. 
There is additional industrial use, I think the same business to the south of this area, which is outside of our half mile study area. So we're focused uh, just on these three parcels. The current total assessed value is about $400,000. Uh, and it, it generates uh, $11,575 a year in tax revenue for the town. Uh, we didn't do any what if scenarios here because it's zoned industrial. So basically the what if is more or less what you, more of what you have in there already. Uh, so we didn't do any what if with the existing zoning. But if we went to a townhouse model in this area, similar to what I showed you on Keller Avenue, you could fit a roughly the same amount of units and you could probably squeeze in a little more if you're willing to tuck them in behind uh, with some local roadways. Generally speaking, uh, as, a des as a, an urban designer, uh, we like to have properties that have a front door onto a public street because they're just much better members of the community than if they are kind of tucked away in some sort of uh, private development. Um, to have uh, a front door forward a public street, uh, it just, it, it, makes, it, it makes for a stronger neighborhood, okay? So it would probably be possible to get in maybe 30 units total, 36 units total on this site if we were to have some, some front doors that were kind of fronting on more of uh, private drives or little courts. Uh, so now we're at 5.5 units per acre and uh, you know garage and driveways. So we're handling all the parking on site. All right, we're not depending on the street to provide parking. The street's th still there for guests and visitors and the UPS, et cetera, but uh, we're handling parking on site in these scenarios. Yeah, it's so bad in the first place. Yeah, to drive in there and even try to get out, especially if you have a, one other car parked there or coming, you have to pull off. Yeah, uh, it's so bad down there, and you'd be adding so many more. Wouldn't it be also that you're going to have to do something with the roadways? So the, yeah, let me speak. Roadways. Yeah, let me speak to that concern. Um, the traffic on Prospect Street, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but we, we have take a, taken a look at some of the traffic numbers in this area. The, the volumes aren't that high. No, right? but if you add this, you would. So 24 units a day. Uh, generally, a, a residential unit will, will generate uh, four, four trips a day, okay, um, on average four trips a day. On average, you, you generate two of those during the peak, uh, afternoon and, and evening peak. So we have another 100 trips a day on the road. Now, a street like Prospect Street, and I, I'd have to take a look at what the ADT is, the average daily traffic. Let's say it's 2,000, which I think is probably high for Prospect Street. It might only be 1,000 cars a day. Uh, we're talking about adding 100 trips. It's, um, we're not yet talking about densities that are going to cause congestion. Will there be more traffic? Yes. Will it cause any sort of congestion that causes any delay where you are waiting in traffic to get anywhere? No. There will be more cars. Uh, will there be driveways to look out for and cars pulling out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, will it cause uh, intersections to stop functioning at this density? No. It's, I, I understand it's a concern. I, I, think think this is, I think the other thing to bear in mind is this is just like, well, would it be appropriate to allow townhouses there? The number of the townhouses, how they're designed, what the traffic flow would be and everything else would be part of the standard you would write into your zoning code. And as part of a special permit, you would have the discretion. And so if, you know, if 36 is not the number or 24 is not the number here, uh, you know, maybe it's some lesser number, but that would be for whoever would come forward and propose it uh, to demonstrate that the traffic works uh, and, and that there are 
are not um, issues. I think what we what we're trying to say with on this site is you have a site near the river, near the train station, zoned industrial, which is uh, really an anachronistic use. I mean, it was put there when the user was dependent on the railroad. All of the supply chain for that particular use now. And, you know, the owner of the site may be there for the next 50 years. I mean, we're not, we're not suggesting that it change, but it would allow for an opportunity so rather than going in and saying we're going to shoehorn a multifamily development into a residential street, we're trying to find sites that we could say with respect to the, the train station uh, and the walkability that if we were going to allow, um, and, and in a lot of instances it isn't going to be higher density because uh, uh, if you're talking 24 townhouses on four acres, uh, that's not much different than the 17 units an acre we already have. Yeah, this this actually, Roger, in this example, it works out to 5.5 units per acre. Yeah, so this is not higher density. It's just allowing for um, a, a, uh, a more efficient use and a higher productive use, both in terms of folks having an opportunity to live near the train station and also to generate uh, more um, more rooftops for businesses and more uh, tax dollars to the town. Well, I think if, if I may, the, one of the, I mean, maybe I agree, parking doesn't seem, well, traffic doesn't seem like an issue in this parcel particularly. And to the extent that the townhouses can accommodate, again, this is all a hypothetical mm -hmm. example, but if they can accommodate the parking on site, that's great. Mm -hmm. I think one of the concerns that I have is just how wide the streets even if the parking is accommodated, you still have people on the street. And then if you have 24 more people trying to exit that onto a main road, you're inching out and people are zipping along. And that either adds to a um, perception of it being congested mm -hmm. or at mm -hmm. least speaks to safety of people walking that way and people zipping along past the openings and more people stopping on the street. So I think part of it to me feels like it should be road widening or, or mm -hmm. more shoulders or something like that because it's hard to pull out on those streets. Well, you, you can always think about one-way well. traffic, too. You know, I, I, I think thinking. that that's what, what happens is that when, when, you, when you're locked into a certain infrastructure and, and a certain road width, you start thinking about, okay, one lane is for parking and the other lane is for travel rather yeah, than trying exactly. to have right. parking two lanes of, on one side yeah, of the street. Two lanes of traffic and, and two lanes yeah. of parking, then it gets really, really congested. But, but again, you know, I think we're, 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 right now we're looking at the big picture as to, right. you know, what could happen. You know, we're, I, we can't get into the details, but, you know, I think that, you know, with some creative thinking and some creative, you know, use of, and again, I don't know how all these roads connect either. You know, they have to right. connect in a circle in order to, to use one-way traffic. But right. right. Right now it's zoned industrial. And so if the existing user goes out, you and any industrial user in that zone could come in there with their tractor trailer trucks that we can't prohibit from going up and down the street. Kenny. But well, that's what I was going to say. That is an ongoing business right now that has serious truck traffic and customers coming and going from the site every single day. It is probably the most dependent business along that rail line that still actively uses it. Mm. So as far as traffic goes down there, this would eliminate a lot of the traffic. How many times has a tractor trailer got hung up on the telephone pole on the corner of Maple Avenue and Pearl Street <laughs> trying to get down to this site? Yeah. Now, I don't see them going anywhere for years and years and years to come. But every single proposed area he's come up with, you're tearing down a business to yeah. put residential housing in. But we're not tearing down anything. All we're saying is we're creating opportunities no, no, no. I for the market Roger, but, to respond. But as as far as the traffic pattern goes, you know, the corner um, Mary Lou Strom Center, how many people come and go from that location every single day yeah. as a business? And now you're going to convert it to residential if that's the spot. The residential is going to be a lesser use traffic pattern wise than having an active business there now. If it was a vacant lot, then I would agree with you that we're increasing traffic flow. But none of the proposed no, sites no, he's no, brought up. Are vacant no I think what he's proposing and I could be wrong 
is these are just ideas that right. they've come Absolutely. up right. with oh, yeah. that we as a commission need to think about because someday those people won't be there and maybe doing multi-use construction and zoning it that way as opposed to just this is a business we've go and can put business yeah and we have to be a little bit more forward thinking at mm -hmm. this point well i think too on that corner there as well you can have businesses there too there was, there was that discussion yeah. you can do business on a lower level then you can do residences up above so there's plenty of we options and ways yeah. we can work with it to see what works best and continue yeah. with the traffic continue with maybe some some of the things we uh, traditionally we have start so. thinking about in the future how do we correct some of these streets that's that's it because that has to be they were it. built back in the 1800s yeah. they weren't yeah. built well, in 2000 we can make suggestions but we can't do anything about no. the streets we could send our suggestions to the town council and again but you know but, i mean we just yeah. have to start thinking oh about i agree it. i That's think it. that so there's a lot of um, need anyway. for better wider i don't know what street with uh you know I, I'm, I'm big on sidewalks uh, so i hope we're all yeah, looking at much. sidewalks and parks sure. and green areas <laughs> um and if the train center is going to be a big focal mm -hmm. transportation adding these types of housing would be yes. beneficial because people would be walking as opposed yes. to driving i agree or biking, or biking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, if uh, the planning magazine said a while back that uh, most businesses turn over every 20, 25 years anyways, most business sites change every 20 or 25 years. So, like you said, it's been here 35 years now. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so, Kelly Fredette's been there. Oh, I know. Longer than that. that. It's been right. Yeah. But plus years. probably another 25 years. The family's not even going to want it anymore because they're all died off. Well, yeah, but then the, you got the other lumber. They have but their like kids they don't want to be in it anymore. Lumber. You know, the kids won't want to be in their business anymore. You know, and they, they probably yeah, and I'm trying to avoid. For whatever reason, I'm trying to change. avoid talking about a business well, name business and trying names, to indicate yeah. because you know, certainly there's been no discussion with them about moving. They're a successful oh. business. They're now. They're there now, and so we're on the level of. But should that land be zoned industrial along the riverfront? Is that the best use of that? And ultimately, uh, if there was to come a time, you know, they would still be able to operate for as long as they want to operate there and, and be in compliance. But it provides more opportunity should it it become available as to what we'd want to see there so that if we leave it the way it is then we will get more industrial on that site and with all of the other areas zoned industrial in the town of Enfield where you could accommodate businesses like that uh, should we try and think of what the riverfront ought to be and so um, you know, that, that whole, um, and I don't know, uh, Francisco, where in your presentation tonight you talk about that whole vision of the open space from town hall all the way over there and so forth. Yeah, I, later? I, I'll, I'll, I can go back to our. Yeah, because I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think we tried to set up an overall broad theme about different areas. And so what we are looking at over along the riverfront is more conservation right along the riverfront uh, that sort of has that access way all the way over into the town hall area where we're sitting. Um, yeah, it's on uh, the land use vision. Um, and so, and it is sort of uh, an industrial zone that kind of is surrounded by, it's really, this sits there by itself. Um, and so I don't want it portrayed as anything of like, oh, we're trying to get an existing business to move. No, we're just putting in place or thinking about putting in place that consistent with what this commission feels is appropriate opportunities. So as things come along uh, and you and you think about, well, what would be the next thing uh, if the uh, if the health center decides that it would be more appropriate to be somewhere else, then that block is virtually empty. 
And so what are the opportunities to to redevelop it? Because if we just keep the zoning in place the way it is, it makes it very, very difficult. And no developer wants to come into the town and the first thing having to do is to change the zone to allow what they want. They want to be able to, we, we want to be able to say, if you come and you're in, in, in conformance with the vision and the rules and regulations, you got an excellent chance of getting approved. Not that the first thing you have to do is convince the commission that a four-story building on that corner overlooking the pond, uh, which retail on the first floor and either residential or commercial above no, it, it great. doesn't, I mean, it. The, the, the notion was, was residential, but it didn't necessarily have to be. Um, but it would be a multi-purpose building on that corner if that's something that you could see your way to. Then that provides other opportunities for the marketplace to invest. We already uh, to allow invest. that, though, business, uh, huh? residential over business down there. Yeah, in the village center zone, yes. that's allowed. Right. Yeah. I have a quick question. But, but what Francisco said is you could only, because of all the setbacks and everything else, you can only put a one-story building there. Well, there's no setback from the sidewalk. We allow it up, up to the sidewalk. That, that particular zone is flexible, but the R33 is completely inflexible. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Because of the you're parking. Talking, you're, yeah, you're because of the you're parking. Still, you're still constrained uh, by, by the parking to, to some degree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question. When you say River Gateway Residential 1 and Residential 2, is there a difference between yeah, those two areas? Uh, so Can you explain? And, and this is something we want to work with you on. But So we see these as uh, different areas, and then we're interested in working with you to establish uh, how they're different. But the darker blue area, River Gateway 2, would be envisioned as a higher density. So R River Gateway 1 would be envisioned as small lot, single family, uh, townhouses, duplexes, very similar to what you have there right now, maybe even fourplexes. Uh, whereas River Gateway 2 would allow for uh, apartment buildings and uh, densities getting above uh, you know, 10 units per acre. Uh, it would potentially allow for up to four floors in the River Gateway 2 area, whereas in the River Gateway 1 area, which is light blue, uh, you probably don't want to go uh, beyond three stories because there are very few examples of more than three stories throughout the, uh, the, that part of the neighborhood. So it, it, it's something we want to work with you on, but the, the reason for having a separate area that allows for higher buildings and perhaps uh, more density uh, is because these are existing sites that if and when they turn over, and River Gateway 2 area encompasses the Allegrassa Manor and, and the other development immediately adjacent to it. Uh, if, if you want to encourage a market that would facilitate revitaliza revitalization of those areas and new development, you have to allow for densities that are going to make it worth someone's while mm. to do it. All right. Uh, and so that's true of both of those areas. You, in the River Gateway 2 area where the industrial zone is, uh, you know, industrial land is, is, is pretty productive land. And so it, you have to make it worth someone's while not to use it for that. Uh, to use it, you, so you have to allow someone to get enough density uh, in there and build high enough to make it worth their while. And also to some extent, we are very sensitive to what's there right now, which is why we did the density analysis and land use analysis. And we wouldn't want to drop in in the middle, in the core of a residential area that's got two, fam uh, two uh, story houses, uh, a four story building. So these areas are somewhat isolated. Uh, river Gateway 2 area is, is really tucked into the bend of, of the river and the pond and is, is really not a contiguous part of the neighborhood. Uh, there's also a shopping plaza there on the south side, kind of a strip mall type shopping plaza. The River Gateway 2 area, it, it's at the very end of, of Prospect Street, and it's really somewhat isolated. There is housing across the street. 
And uh, so we think more density there might, uh, could make sense. And so let me get to the last slide to show you another, beyond the townhouses I showed you, another example of what um, could work there. Okay. Uh, so if we were to allow for apartment buildings on that site, four, four story, you can get a lot of units in. And, and this is starting to bump up against your concerns about traffic, but it's something that have to need to be considered and looked at. In this scenario, we show 144 apartment units, and uh, it could look like the image on the bottom of the screen there, that picture, that's four stories, uh, you know, setbacks that allow for some landscaping in front, nice sidewalks. Uh, here we have three buildings, and the total assessed value of this type of development uh, we estimate to be around $7.4 million, which would generate $233,000 a year in property taxes. So from a build-out analysis, this is feasible. Right? We figured out it fits on the site. You can provide all the parking you need and back. Uh, so from a design perspective, aesthetically, it'll probably look pretty good because you're not looking at lots of parking from the street itself. Um, you know, the traffic is, wor is worthy of more investigation as to whether or not this would uh, cause any significant issues with the traffic. Uh, I think you'll note that the driveways are lined up uh, opposite Maple and Oak Street so that you're not unloading all the traffic straight to prospect. It, it could be distributed onto, you know, three different streets. It's, it's this type, it, it, having regulations in place that allow this type of development would cause a property owner to think about, could I be doing something else with this property? It, it creates the opportunity. On something like that, would it be economically feasible to put, the, let's say, the garage and put that on top? To put the building on top and, and then gives you open space for it? Yeah. So the numbers are tough. Uh, yeah, you know, if this were if this were in, in downtown Westport, yes, I mean they're doing exactly that with a project they just finished last year, I think. Um, here it's difficult because you can make it happen without building the garage. So why would you want to incur all the extra costs if you can make it happen without building the garage? And the surface parking itself isn't terribly detrimental to the neighborhood because it's backed up against the rail. Uh, it provides kind of a buffer between the housing and the rail. And it's not highly visible from the surrounding uh, properties or the street. So here's an example where the uh, developer, this is most likely the way they would build it. Um, uh, to build a, a parking deck would add significantly to the cost, at which point it, they'd probably want to go to five stories and they might want to get some commercial, which is you can get you know, two or three times as much per square foot for those types of tenants. Uh, it, so it, it's very different in this location versus on Main Street, where in Main Street you have a better opportunity to have uh, commercial uh, rents and you could take advantage of charging for public parking. If the Strand Theater were to redevelop, you could have a lease agreement with them, you could charge for it. There's a lot, a lot more viable commercial options to subsidize that parking in, in that area. Here in a more residential neighborhood, it, you're, you're probably not going to see it. Okay. I just want to note that this is we gave the the commission your presentation. Oh yeah, well, as yeah. we as we knew it as of two o'clock yeah. this afternoon. So yeah. Just the commission should be impressed that this is a truly iterative process because yeah. we have they don't have that in their presentation. I, I have a terrible habit of working on things all the way to the last minute. Because, <laughs> you know, it really, uh, as you keep working on it, you, get more you know, the ideas just keep coming forward. And so, um, piece would be so yeah, I, and, and this changed, Roger and I spoke earlier in the week and it's changed since then. It changed from last week when Roger and I met. Yeah, okay. uh, so it is, thank you, Roger, it is an iterative uh, process. Um, and and I have, I'll be happy uh, when I get back to my office in the morning to send a PDF copy to Roger so he can distribute to you so you have exactly what you're looking at today. How tough would it be to market that with the railroad tracks going by that? Right? Well, uh, uh, there is, oh yeah, it's a fantastic question. I, I, I get asked that question all the time. 
Uh, there are countless examples of residential development that are directly on and abutting the railroad tracks. I mean, 10 or 20 feet. Uh, right now in West Hartford, there's a TOD development on the fast track line, which runs parallel to the new Hartford Rail commuter line, which comes through this area, of housing that's going up. And it, I mean, it was shoehorned into an old Pontiac dealer site, and they've got all of 10 foot setback from the sidewalk to the, in the street in the front, of the front of the apartment building and maybe 20 feet in back between the rail line and the fast track line. And it really comes down to the quality of the construction, uh, to uh, the, the glazing on the windows, you know, triple. Is there tree, is there tree buffer to, to stop some of the Yeah, noise? I think they're going to do a lance. For, trees do not block sound. Oh. They're, there they're visual barriers only. They do almost nothing to block sound. Um, it, well, it's I remember it being on a train going through Chicago, and if yeah. you opened the window of the train, you could slap the buildings. They were that oh, close. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. sure. Well, I mean, I've been in Bigelow, and I you don't hear the trains going yeah. by, even though they're right there, I and I've been in the buildings yeah. there. So, so a lot of that comes to construction. quality construction, and, and that's something to some extent you, you could control with some of your building regs. Especially if we're talking about putting high-speed rail through there, too. Yeah. <laughs> Those well, and, and quiet. as a reminder, it's going to be commuter rail service. And it's not truly going to be high speed. Well, they're talking, initially they were talking both. The, the long, long, yeah. long range vision. You know, and I'm dead, but and, still. And I, I say that because we were on the team that did a lot of the planning work for this, and I did some of the maps that showed it going all the way up to Montreal uh, seven years ago. And that is the long, long term vision. And it's something to, be, to think about. Uh, you know, whatever you build there, you want to build for the vision for the corridor. Mm. Uh, so all of that being said, you know, this, I, I don't see the rail line as being a non-starter here for any development and proximity of it. There's ways of mitigating against that. And one of the biggest issues with rail corridors is, uh, and had been, and is changing to some extent, is not necessarily the sound of the train itself and the tracks, but of the horn. Yeah, the, the whistles. For at, at grade crossings, which they're required to blow at at grade crossings, but the DOT is moving towards uh, a, an actuated horn system where the horn is located, instead of on the train, it's located at the crossings and directed at the crossings, and it's actuated by the train hitting a switch yeah. further down the line so they don't have to blow the whistle Could all the way down the line. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is the biggest difference and and one of the reasons they're moving towards that is to be more supportive of transit oriented development uh, and to allow for housing in proximity to the rail corridor good well i actually i think that's very true because i live in, in a neighborhood that um is right behind the tracks that come through down yale broadleaf down that way and basically down back there I can hear the train inside my house coming by but if I'm in Bigelow I can't hear it mm -hmm. so you can tell the difference between what the buffers and what the houses and things that yeah. you know the sound is different it hits different things and it and I think that if you construct it correctly I think yeah absolutely you're, it's not gonna be an issue okay so our next steps and I, and I do want to hear other questions or comments that you have are, are basically we want to continue to develop the basic elements of an ordinance, you know, the framework of it. So we've started with a vision of what we think could work where. Um, and we want to ad adjust some of those boundaries and lines and areas as needed. We want to determine which existing uses should be made conforming. You have a lot of non-conforming uses, because mainly because of the R33 zone. Uh, so we want to determine, well, what, do you, what, do you re what really works about this neighborhood? And it's probably the residential units that you have. And so how should your zoning change to make those uses conforming? Uh, establish what uh, uses you, you want within these zones, what uses should be allowed by right or by special permit. Uh, establish appropriate building heights for each district. Uh, determine setbacks and FAR, uh, which, which affects densities. Establish parking requirements. So they're directly ad addressing parking issues rather than uh, ignoring them. And uh, determine the extent to which design guidelines should be incorporated into the ordinance. Um, you know, you don't want something that's overly restrictive and burdensome to use. 
At the same time, there are probably some design elements that are very important to you, uh, such as uh, materials and roofs and, and that sort of thing, that it probably makes sense to establish that in, in the document. And we want to do this uh, working with you and by, as Roger mentioned, an iterative process of coming back to you with, okay, this is how far we've gotten, what do you think of this, what can we agree on, and, and then, all right, let's move on to the next thing and slowly build this framework. So there would be elements uh, that rather than one ordinance with four zones, we might start and then look at that, um, that residential river gateway one zone, which would be uh, the uses by right would be like the Hartford and uh, Bigelow Street houses that are already there and figure out, you know, what, 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 what makes those conforming, or make, what makes most of them. And then uh, if you were going to allow other types of housing at, at a similar scale uh, rather than the single family on the individual lot, uh, that, that would be a special permit use. Um, you know, it, with, with design standards and you may want to restrict it to certain streets or things of that kind. So we'd work on each particular element um, separately um, and uh, within that framework because I know the commission specifically has told me uh, several times you don't want to all of a sudden see one big fat document. Uh, so. I think, you know, and if you have this as the basis of what we're looking at and, you know, if there's uh, something in here that gives you pause, you know, think about it. Um, and um, so I would just say for the chairman's benefit, um, I heard a lot about a certain housing on a certain street in a certain town and you we didn't identify them, but these are from that community, Mr. Chairman, that you said you didn't want River Gateway to become. So I didn't know if you noticed them, but you know this the these are these are houses from another town as you you were quoted in the comments one time as saying that your concern with the previous proposal back in 2013 was that you would you would get houses that look like this so that's what we were saying is that uh with respect to it's not density per se it's it's uh it's design it's more the design of the houses. Yeah, and so um, we didn't want to pick on any other community and identify where it was. So, but, uh, so we didn't identify where those not so good looking houses were. They're not in Enfield. Uh, but but uh, so we're, we're trying to be responsive and and to say you know that yeah the newer designs so so that I mean that's uh, that's basically it it's uh, we're moving forward and our goal is to uh, work with the commission every month and to be able to do the uh, charrettes with the public. Uh, in uh, June and have these uh, have this process you know wrapped up uh, after that so first off we would be coming back with 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 the elements of regulations we would mark them up fine-tune them um, build them uh, and then we have the charrettes uh, that the Commission would would uh, would would hold uh, and invite everybody to come in and talk to them. And obviously, you don't make any final decisions until you hear from the public and you hear all of the comments. Right. And then move on. Right. Yeah. So um, I hope that you know you're um, you feel that we're uh, being responsible to the direction that we've been given and uh, we look forward and we we know we only gave it to you this afternoon um, but when we saw the agenda for tonight and a couple of things being postponed it provided an opportunity and we kind of said to uh, Francisco can you crank this thing up and so 
Uh, that's why it was like adding things. We added stuff yesterday, the day before, and so forth. And we've been marking on it. Peter's been work. Peter and I and Francisco. Uh, Michael has uh, weighed in on several elements. He's seen it. He couldn't be. He was invited to be here tonight. He couldn't make it. He's out of town. Uh, so hopefully everybody is working together. Um, and we look forward to you know your comments as we move it forward. If there's something you want to convey, you know, uh, to us as we go along, uh, you think about it. Driving home tonight, tomorrow, the next day, you know, move it forward. I think the design standards help. It's well, we just did that on some of those, and it, it helped a lot uh, with the uh, the roof uh, mm -hmm. solar. And it really helped a lot. Helped the people. We haven't. Well, we haven't had a complaint at the uh, at the commission. You might have had complaints upstairs, but nothing, nothing like what we had before. Because there's one more thing that I think that we we should recognize is, is that the size of the units, you know, is is going to more or less establish as to you know how big of a you know, family might be moving in or, you know, how much flexibility it, you know, the unit might have in terms of if somebody's working at home with, if they need a home office and things like that. So that, you know, if we could start looking at, you know, possibly, you know, is it a, a, a 900 square foot how, you know, unit or is it an 1100 square foot unit or, you know, and, and you know, approximately, you know, how many bedrooms would be associated with that. Because I, I know there are some people who are looking for like a second residence, you know, where, you know, they might want to be coming into Enfield and, and have another home in Florida, but not necessarily own a home in Enfield that needs to be maintained. So that, you know, in the wintertime, they can just leave it alone because they don't have to shovel the snow. They don't have to worry about, you know, you know, a lot of other things and that, you know, it, it's, and, and they prefer to have a little more luxury rather than, you know, being in the same room as their husband or wife right. all the time and, and having some place to sort of escape. So yep. I think, I think, you know, the size of the units is, is kind of, you know, a, a, an indication as to what direction things are going to be going to. By, by allowing for a range of housing type, you know, small lot, single family, duplexes, townhouse apartment buildings you're providing greater opportunity to accommodate a lot of different types and sizes of units for different types of families you know an apartment you're you're going to have one and two bedrooms that are going to be the most common type of unit in an apartment uh, more rarely see a three unit uh, uh three bedroom uh, unit in an apartment it, you'll typically more often see that in uh you know, a townhouse or a duplex type house. So beyond ranges of units, you really need a range of housing to provide uh, uh, housing for, for whatever the market will support. Yeah, in, in terms of, you know, and I, and, and I like the fact that, you know, we have a visual as to what it could look like and, mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, realistically, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to say, you know, there are different, you know, ways to, to provide a building. It doesn't necessarily have to be rectangular or square. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's just a coloration of, of the, the different, you know, levels or, or you oh, know, sure. the different blocks that, that sort of create, you know, a, 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 a more or less a rectangular facade, but that, you know, normally with a little bit of articulation, it, it, mm -hmm. it makes it very interesting and very desirable to, to live in those kind of units. Yep. And I, I absolutely agree, and I just I think that speaks to the the presentation. I think you did an excellent job of giving us, you know, for some of us that lack some vision, giving us those examples and showing us what it might look like, and so we're not just afraid of density, because mm -hmm. um, the design plays such a big part. Um, so thank you for that. It was sure. really, really informative, really interesting. I did have one question, more along the nitty gritty, but going back to your land use vision, would you envision the mixed use also to be of a higher density resident? Like, I know it's mixed use, so you'd have a combo. Yeah, so what what the market study tells us right. is that your, your strongest market for development is residential, is the driver, that retail is really weak. The good news is as as you're able to bring residential online, you're strengthening your retail market so you have better capacity to have um, 
a little restaurant or cafe or market or something to that effect. Um, so in the mixed use areas, we definitely envision residential development on the upper floors. Uh, the other types, usually retail is almost exclusively on the ground floor for obvious reasons. But very often it includes upper floor office. Your office market, there is no market for office here right now. And, and the development with Mass Mutual this past week has not helped that matters out at all. So it's, it's very unfortunate. Uh, so we can't look to office as a, as a strong driver anytime in the near future here because you have vacancy to accommodate all of the demand you have in the area right now. You have existing vac vacancy, which tells us, well, what are you going to put on those upper floors? It's going to be residential right now in today's market. But you need to design an ordinance that is going to be relevant 10 years from now when maybe that changes to have that flexibility. Okay. I've been, cur I've been curious quite a while now about uh, most of the bigger developments I've seen throughout the East Coast anyways is like in Baltimore and in uh, D.C. and even in uh, Springfield. They've brought in either foreign investors or mm. large investors, they don't do it piecemeal. How could we get some of that interest in our area? Yeah, there's, when, once you get, and I don't know where the exact number is, but this comes from talking with a few different people that specialize in these markets and, and some developers. Once you get beyond a development that's 20 units or so, you, you, get, you get far beyond your local de developers and what they're able to finance. Right. All right. So now you're moving to something that's backed with, with significant capital, uh, something that's, you know, out of state, in some cases international. And uh, that has been happening in Connecticut. There, there is, and Roger's very familiar living in Bloomfield, there's a uh, the Heirloom Flats in Bloomfield, that is, uh, I think it's a Toronto-based development firm, if I'm thinking of the right firm, uh, that developed that. And this is in Bloomfield Center, uh, which they don't have transit, uh, traditional town center. Um, it, it is a four to five story development of a couple hundred units, right immediately south of the historic town center. Mm -hmm. What made that opportunity possible was that seven or eight years ago when the town did its POCD, it identified that area as having potential for increased density. And at the time, it was some uh, single family houses on quarter acre lots. Uh, so they rezoned the area to allow for it. Uh, the town and the state consequently did some road work in the area that needed to be done for safety purposes, but they also did it in mind of supporting higher density. Uh, so it was as part of this long range vision. Uh, what was amazing to see is how, really how quickly it transpired. And, and I, you know, I don't know how the developer got interested, but I do know that the zoning was in place to allow for that development. And it is there, uh, I think they, they already rented many of the units. They're putting some of the finishing touches on it right now. And if you're in that, part of Bloomfield, you know, it might be informative just to take a swing by uh, and take a look. And it's, it's pretty well done. It strikes me as a little too much. The fifth story just seems like too much. But, you know, I understand the developer probably had to get that in to make the numbers work. And the, and the town was probably convinced of that as well. So there, there are plenty of examples of, of, out of, of out of state and serious capital coming in and being able to do a couple hundred units in a year or two. Right. Okay. But, yeah, the only negative feedback that, yeah. that it exists in Bloomfield on that housing is they would have liked stronger design standards uh, yeah. for, for what it looks like. Uh, it's a little too modern for a yeah, traditional yeah, town but center. I mean, but, uh, and, but I mean, that's individual taste, mm -hmm. uh, really. Uh, but uh, there weren't any design standards. And so I think a lot of people were surprised when it actually went up what it looked yeah. like. And that those garages that they have right on the main street yeah. there are a little funky. But you're right, is they, uh, 
and the only difference between Bloomfield and Enfield is the POCD that Enfield did in 2010, we, did, we haven't had the follow on put the zoning in place. So this neighborhood, River Gateway, where we're now talking about put that follow on zoning in place, what we're, what we're also doing is putting the follow on zoning in place in the mall and other areas. That concludes our presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Very well done. Yes, thank you. Uh, appreciate thank you. it. Uh, and I guess we can work on sections now. Thank you. <laughs> I keep you know, uh, we're going to continue to work on these uh, thoughts, and uh, there's nothing cast in stone. And, uh, you know, as you look at it and as you put the pieces together, it can be modified, it can be modified down the road as just the charrettes. Once you get by through the charrettes and you put an actual ordinance and uh, draft uh, zoning ordinance in place, then you know it would go out to the Capital Region Council of Governments and it'll go to formal public hearing. Uh, and so that may extend over the summer and into the fall, but uh, Francisco's work would would be done by by June. Well, this is helps, and this is the type of thing I want, so that he isn't hung up later. Right. Catching up with us, or us catching up with him. Right. And so we've we've asked him to uh, sort of uh, be on standby until we work out with the chair and leadership of the commission what the nights are that you want to take this up. But we're looking at you know uh, t uh, one or two nights a month through June to deal with this. Uh, so we will put together a proposed schedule and circulate it for you and and so that we can lock in this is what we're doing and, and so forth. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to just say, okay, well, what is it we would like to see there but and actually put the tools in place so that if we can attract investment, uh, they will know what it is that they have the opportunity to build. Yeah. Uh, at least, well, you got the second, uh, well, you got this, the other Thursdays, but. Right. So it either be the second, it, either, it will be the second uh, Thursday and possibly the fourth Thursday of the month. It was a what would be? Uh, the fourth Thursday or Monday through Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll have to decide. And so we'll we'll put some alternate dates, and you know, people circle them all, and we'll see what we want to do. Can, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Sure, you're welcome. What? Oh yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I just get. She's giving me the sign. <laughs> Okay, other business. Uh, correspondence, anything? No? Commissioner's correspondence? Director of Planning. Oh, sorry, oh, I'm I, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Item 11, Commissioner's correspondence. Right, and, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Just, just uh, not quite sure, again, it's the, uh, the most appropriate forum, but. Um, there was a um, there was an accident last summer on Freshwater Boulevard that knocked off one of the uh, street lights, and since that time the lights on on Freshwater has stopped working, and you know I I I work by that street and it's very very dark at night, and we have you people that I mentioned that walk through there all the time, and um, some sometimes people speed through that. Right. Street and without lights, I think that's just an accident waiting to happen. We'll that look into it and get you an answer. Fix, um, item, you know, on the computer, the C click fix because it's public works and the town council that do the lighting in the roads. I'm, I'm not familiar, so maybe you, but we can take it offline and you can point me in the right direction. Yes, not a yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything, anyone further? Okay. Uh, commissioners, uh, director of planning. 
Yeah, the only two things I have is a couple of administrative approvals to report. Um, one is, uh, is an application for Sprint to be located in a former Cox communication unit. Um, I almost feel like we got, we, we reported this out already, Raquel, but, but it, it was just a name change. Uh, but this is over in 54 Hazard Avenue. It's one uh, telecommunications unit occupying another telecommunications unit building. There are no issues. And then on uh, 604 Enfield Street, uh, we have one jiu-jitsu school replacing another jiu-jitsu school. So I think you'd be okay with, with that. Um, but, you know, I, the regulations require that I report them out. Um, and uh, that's all I have. And I will note that uh, we sent you after after six o'clock tonight the uh, uh, a list of the status of applications. Uh, look for it on your computer. Uh, this is in it. It's uh, called Planning Division Status of Applications. And what it does is it tells you. Uh, what the status is of applications that are either in pre-application review or they formally applied, whether they've applied at ZBA or wetlands or planning, um, and if they've got an approval there, where they are and as far as coming forward to this commission, and then where they are on post-commission approvals, and then where they are on uh, construction, and then where they are on getting their certificate of zoning compliance um, after they have uh, constructed their um, their application. And we hope that uh, we, we've distributed it to the building department and the town manager's office as well. And we hope it's helpful to you as well because you get questions out there all the time about, gee, this was approved two months ago. I haven't seen anything happen. What's the status? Mm -hmm. And many times it's either the, you know, something, some reason or, or rather, and by just looking at this list, we hope to get, get it to you a couple of times a month. Um, hopefully it, it answers a lot of questions for you. And if it triggers questions in your mind, then please call and let us know. And then we did give you an updated uh, zoning enforcement report that you can look over. And um, I was, um, last week uh, or two weeks ago, you brought up a zoning uh, question and I said I'd look into it. And if I had only read the report that you had in front of you, it was actually covered in that report. Uh, and uh, that situation, Rick informs me, and this report has been resolved. This was the one with the banners and the flashing lights and everything else that was actually covered in Rick's report two weeks ago. Uh, so um, we didn't get a chance because of that long, long meeting to go into it. So we have another updated one for you. And um, given the given the hour, uh, our goal is always to be out of here by 9:30. So I haven't looked in Mary's direction lately, but she's probably. Uh, oh, Mary's been after me instead. <laughs> I I just want to add one thing on that one with the flashing lights, and uh, it, it's still going on. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, well, okay, and that's the feedback we have to have. But what I was told this afternoon is. Uh, uh, that the lights have come down. So uh, the there might be a down. delay from when they said they were taking them down until when they actually come the down. I uh, still have the sandwich boards out yeah. there. there they still have the lights. Yeah. Do, yeah. So. I have one All right, well, they've been informed and they've been cited and they've told us that they're going in There's the direction a, they need to I be. I hadn't noticed out there is the ice box. Mm -hmm. The refrigerator, you mean? No, he's got sells ice. Oh, sells ice. So he's got a ice box on the front there, yeah. on the front sidewalk. I had a couple things very quickly. Um, I noticed on, on uh, Rick's um, report the uh, the Enfield Pizza. Um, they were they're working with him, but I can tell you I was there Saturday. And there's no sign posted yet saying no parking in right. the vehicle. Right, and, and two there. weeks ago when we all left this meeting at about 11 p.m., yep. there were cars parked yeah. there. And the um, and the other two things, um, I noticed I go on Facebook a lot, 
and I noticed that they're having a boxing event at 95 High Street, and um, I didn't know if that was anything you were aware of or needed to be aware of. It's coming. And uh, also, <laughs> you might want to tell Rick this, um, the Felician Sisters are getting ready to have a, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor are getting ready to have an event, and they're on Facebook looking for those wavy men, <laughs> you know, those inflated are signs. Are you telling Ooh. on the nuns? Oh and we don't gosh. allow them, so. I know. You know. You no, 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 no. But that's just it. I wanted to make you aware of it so you didn't get unpleasantly surprised. Can, can I make a suggestion, Roger, uh, just for efficiency and simplicity? Is it possible that you could explore putting uh, the, the report and the list online through the town's website and make it available to us, maybe password protected? Um, sure. Just. Roger, we explore been, anything. You've been emailing on us with it, um, uh, two different ones. Uh, one's the uh, change of change of regulations concerning the, the, the housing. Uh, somebody wants to change. Right. Um, actually, uh, I had a com I had a conversation. This is this is the issue of the housing authorities' housing on Enfield Street, which is uh, is in an historic uh, district, R33, and uh, we had we had provided them a, a road map of how that we believed that they could get an application before this commission. Uh, they hired outside counsel who wanted to um, make um, changes to the regulations, which I didn't feel was necessary and I didn't feel was helpful for other regu other entities. And so um, I had suggested to them that maybe that there there needed to be a meeting with myself and the leadership of this commission and the leadership of the housing authority to <laughs> to look into that situation. Um, the um, one of the uh, attorneys, law partners I have worked with over the years on many other things, and I cc'd him on it, and he called me today, uh, fully understood my issues, and uh, has said they will not be pursuing what they his partner had said they were going to be pursuing. Okay, because I, so I think that's been resolved. Okay, that, because I was going to say, if you wanted, we could have. I, the state allows us to have a discussion after right. the meeting. Um, and the other was on uh, uh, McDonald's. I guess they're having a... Yeah, on uh, uh, the two McDonald's, I did receive a call today that uh, they're uh, uh, not wanting to uh, produce the design that you are uh, your regulations call for in either the Enfield Design District or the or the Skidical Design District. They're now uh, talking about minimizing what they do there and concentrating on handicap accessibility and so forth. So um, that's their current position and they will be revising what it is they're gonna do. <laughs> and I, I know we're almost at the bottom of the agenda, but just to jump on what Commissioner Salazar said, I was um, wondering, I know a few meetings ago we had some of the application packets emailed to us and I was just wondering if we could continue doing that because um, it is helpful if I'm away from my materials to have that. Right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're wherever possible we're going to, uh, you know, email things. We can't email the maps, but uh, everything but the maps, if it's all right, uh, we will we'll email them and then uh, we'll, um, uh, you have them ahead of time. There are some commissioners who still would like the hard copy in their books. So we kind of have a hybrid system going now. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying replace the paper yeah. at all. I mean, I prefer it that way. Sometimes but when we, we get more money, we'll get the... Oh, I but when you email them, you can keep them in a not file. A so if you need to review the minutes yeah. right. or anything, you have them readily available without having to call here and come down or whatever and wait. No, it's it's absolutely here, fine and, and we scan have. everything in anyhow so we can scan you know because we're in the process we have our the 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 official uh paper file and then we have everything in view permit which is a digital system and we're hopefully we will eliminate the paper file altogether 
uh, as we move along. But just a, a quick point on the maps, though. I, don't you get electronic versions of the maps for the We do, and we can send those to you as well. A lot of people find it difficult to read the maps depending on what you're you know, what you're using it for and the size. I guess but what, if what you saying. if you have the capability and a large enough monitor and you would like them, we can send them to you. Right, yeah. And and again, I'm not suggesting to yeah. take away the paper copies. I guess my goal is to have wherever I may be to be able to pull it up on the computer and look at the entire application that I would have wherever I am because we have that capability and right. and if we do eventually want to go paperless, which again I'm not necessarily suggesting, if we get in the habit of emailing the full application packet that we get delivered to us, um, then we can learn to rely on it and then go from there. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn? Second. 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 Oh, you take thirds? Yeah.